Let's all stand together. Number 34. <clears throat> It is finished, sinners hear it, hear the dying Savior's cry, hear the Lord himself declare it, justice has been satisfied. It is finished, go proclaim it to poor sinners far and wide. Holy Spirit, make them hear it. Jesus Christ for sinners died. It is finished, all is over. Jesus drank damnation dry. What a Savior, what a Savior. See him now, exalted high. It is finished, look, behold him, seated at his Father's side. Yonder on the throne, behold him, Christ our substitute who died. It is finished, hear him pleading, as our advocate on high. His own blood's great merit pleading, pleading justice satisfied. It is finished, can you hear him? All the work is fully done. Now believing, looking to him, we are saved by God's own Son. Please be seated. Good evening. Let's open our Bibles together to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. <clears throat> One of the things that I want us to see tonight from our text in John chapter 4 is what it means to come to Christ. And, uh, and here, the psalmist prays, or, or the Lord commands through the psalmist, O oh, come, O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your heart, as in the day of provocation, as the day uh, of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart. Here we get some understanding about what it means to worship and, and come in faith. It's a, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It is the people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thy Sabbath our rest, the Lord Jesus Christ, the hope of our comfort, our salvation, our peace with God, 
by his shed blood. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit. We pray for, for you to open our ears and enable us to hear thy voice from thy word. Lord, we thank you that you've spoken by the prophets and the apostles, and we pray now that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you would cause us to, to seek after Christ and to, to come in faith to him. We thank you, Lord, that all that we, all that we need and all that we have is bound up in his glorious person and in his accomplished work. Thank you for this time of worship. Lord, enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Number 199 in your hardback hymnal. Let's stand together again. 199. <clears throat> together to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. <clears throat> I've titled this message, The Nature of Saving Faith. The Nature of Saving Faith. Um, a little over a month ago, we started uh, looking at the miracles that John um, writes his gospel around and uh, dealt with the 
turning the water into wine at the Feast of Canaan. And uh, the second miracle that John tells us about is, uh, is the healing of the nobleman's son, which we're going to look at tonight. You have your Bibles open to John chapter 4. We'll begin reading at verse 33. Now, after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again unto Canaan of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman. A nobleman is just that, is a, a man of nobility. Uh, the word is used to describe kings and princes and servants of kings, or high-ranking servants of kings. So that's where this man was. The Lord is in Canaan. Uh, Capernaum is about 15 miles away from Canaan. And so this man hears that the Lord Jesus Christ is in Canaan, at Cana, and he goes there from Capernaum. <clears throat> so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea unto Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman saith unto him, Sir, and that word sir is the Lord Curios, most often translated Lord in the New Testament. I don't know why the translators put sir here, but it's Lord. So this nobleman comes before the Lord and calls him Lord. The nobleman saith unto him, Lord, come down ere my child die. And Jesus saith unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea unto Galilee. I remind you that John writes his gospel account a little differently than does Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because they are a synopsis or a summary uh, placed in some sort of chronological order of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in his public ministry. Um, um, Luke, when he begins writing his, his gospel account, uh, says others have written, uh, he's, you remember Luke is addressing Theophilus, and he says, most excellent Theophilus, I know others have written in order the things that, that the Lord did, and uh, it seemed good that I should do the same. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written in a chronological order of events. Uh, John doesn't write that way. John uh, it, uh, gospel is more like a sermon built around the seven I am's and the seven miracles. Uh, the first miracle, you remember, the water uh, changed to wine in Cana, uh, tells us about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tells us who he is as he came to bring an end to the law <laughs> uh, for righteousness and uh, tells about who he is and his work of redemption by, the, by his shed blood, uh, pictured by that new wine and that new covenant. Um, and now this, and then, and then after the miracle of Cana, 
Uh, we have the story of Nicodemus and the woman at the well, which sort of give testimony to what the Lord taught in that miracle. And now he's going to uh, move to the second point in his sermon, uh, the, uh, the healing of the nobleman, which tells us what the true nature of saving faith is. That's the story we just read, tells us what the true nature of saving faith is. <clears throat> we know that faith is a gift of God. We know the Lord has to give us saving faith. No question about that. Uh, we can't drum it up ourselves. It's not, a, it's not a decision that we make or a commitment that we resolve to. Uh, to. It's, it's a gift. For by grace you have saved through faith, and that is a gift of God. We know that it's impossible to please God without faith. For they that come to him must believe that he is, and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what is faith? It's trust. It's to believe from the heart. It's to rest the hope of your salvation in the person of Christ. Uh, it is to rejoice in him. <laughs> the nature of faith is childlike. It's, uh, it's, it's humility before God. Um, that's what faith is. It's not some sort of character trait that we present to God and boast in of ourselves. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's an admission of our dependence and our reliance upon the Lord Jesus Christ for everything. Uh, it's just the opposite of what most people think when they talk about, when they talk about faith. Uh, it's, it's an admission of, of our dependence. It's not self-reliance. It's not self-righteousness. It's, it's not self-confidence. It, faith looks away from self. That's what faith does. It can't find anything in self for the hope of one's salvation. Uh, it has to look outside of itself. It has to find another that is able to provide what self cannot provide. <laughs> and that's what saving faith is. That's, that's the, the essence of saving faith. It's looking to the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. I have eight simple points I want to try to make tonight from this passage of scripture. And, um, and the first one is that saving faith is only needed when it's a matter of eternal life and death. Notice that uh, this man, he believed the word that the Lord had spoken unto him, but he had a need that no one else could meet. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are coming to him with a need that no one else can meet. Uh, we're not coming to him to just help us out with some uh, worldly issues. We're, we're, we're saying, Lord, this is, this is life and death. <laughs> Lord, if you don't save me, I won't be saved. Uh, this man was desperate um, <clears throat> so many times we hear men talk about faith as if it's just something that improves your life in this world. Um, no, saving faith is the only means to life, period. There is no life outside of, outside of Christ. In him is life. <laughs> And the life was the light of the world. Um, so we see in this story a man who is desperate and who is in need of life. He's not coming in order to be delivered from a habit or some sort of addiction or, you know, to improve his life in this world. He's coming uh, because his child is dying. And if the Lord doesn't come... Uh, there will be no hope for life. 
And it is a picture, isn't it? It's a picture of how we come. Uh, saving faith is coming to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, for our life. Saving faith is what sinners do. <laughs> for the wages of sin is death. Um, and this is a faithful saying. Christ came to save sinners. <laughs> uh, so we come for salvation. <clears throat> David said in Psalm 22, verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth. The lion's mouth, Satan and death and hell and the grave and the wrath that is to come and all those things, Lord, that's, that's what I need to be saved from. And so if we're trusting Christ, yes, we trust him for our, for our temporal circumstances and for our worldly fleshly needs, but saving faith is trusting him for the forgiveness of our sins. It's trusting his life for our righteousness. It's trusting his death for our justification. It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that, you know, there's a lot of things we can do to help and maybe even solve a lot of the problems that we experience in this world. But there's not a single thing that we can do to solve our sin problem. And so saving faith is seen in this man. It's only needed when eternal life and eternal death is at stake. Listen to what David said in Psalm 57, verse 2. I will cry unto God most high, unto God who performeth all things for me. I'm going to cry unto the one who performs all things for me. There's nothing I can do to perform my salvation. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. What is it that would swallow us up? Death would swallow us up. The grave would swallow us up. But we know that that, that death has been swallowed up by victory. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ swallowed up death. He swallowed up the grave. And so just like this man came in desperation to the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sin and for the salvation of his soul. That's how we come. Save me, O oh God, for the waters have come into my soul, David said. Peter, when he was drowning, said, Lord, save me. Save me. And so the, the waters would over, overwhelm us. Uh, the grave would consume us. The wrath of God would destroy us. If all we need is to be saved from the consequences of a particular sin, then maybe a therapist or a lawyer could help us out. But we've got to be saved from our sin nature. We've got to be saved from death. And uh, here's how this man came. Saving faith is coming to the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. <laughs> to be saved. <clears throat> Only dead and dying sinners need saving faith. Only those who have been bitten by the, by the bitter sting of that serpent of death need a brazen serpent on a pole to look to only they oh there's lots of different kinds of faith in this world and uh men men believe and then they don't believe or they believe for this and that this man came lord my child is going to die if you don't save if you don't come there's no other, there's no other hope. When the spirit of God convicts us of our sin, you know, conscience is sufficient to convict us of bad behavior. Conscience is, is sufficient. A lot of people uh, get ashamed in their hearts for things that they do that they know are wrong. 
The law of God's written on every man's heart. But uh, for unbelief and for a sin nature, <laughs> what did the Lord say? It's expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But when he comes, he will convict the world of sin because they believe not on me. Lord, there's my problem. There's my problem. If you don't give me saving faith, I'll die an unbeliever. That's all I can do. The Spirit of God has convicted me that my sinful nature is nothing but unbelief. Lord, I need faith. I need to believe. And I also need you to help my unbelief. <laughs> the second thing we learn about the nature of saving faith from our, from this miracle. And remember that the first miracle tells us about the person and work of Christ. And this miracle tells us about the nature of saving faith. And the second thing we learn is that faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. It begins with hearing. How can they have faith? How can they believe unless they hear. Um, they can't call until they believe and they can't believe until they hear and they can't hear without a preacher. This is it. This is the voice of God. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what he, look what, look what he said um, in, uh, in verse 50. Jesus said unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that had been spoken unto him, but he believed because he first heard. Look at uh, <clears throat> verse 47. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea, <laughs> this man heard the stories of the miracles that the Lord had performed. John's only recorded two of them. We know that when he was in, when he was in Jerusalem, he did other things and, um, you know, I love the way John finishes his gospel. He says, many other things did the Lord, but these are recorded that you might believe and that believing you might have life through his name. So this man had heard not just about the turning, maybe, maybe he hadn't heard about the turning of the water into wine, but he had heard about a lot of the things that the Lord had done. And so he came believing. <clears throat> Turn with me to Genesis chapter three. I want you to see this. We have to hear. And we know that the, that the hearing ear and the seeing eye are both from the Lord. The Lord's got to unstop our ears. He's got to speak. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3, the, 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 the remedy for the first sin was hearing. Look at verse, look at verse 8 of Genesis chapter 3. And they heard the voice. Now they've, they've sinned and they're hiding and they're fearful and, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God speaks to him, but he heard. Begins with hearing. There's no salvation apart from hearing. That's why it's so important for us to, to declare the gospel, to preach the gospel. Now, salvation doesn't begin with hearing. Um, salvation begins in election. <laughs> Uh, you know, we often speak of our, of our new birth as our salvation, but it's much more accurate to speak of our new birth as our calling. You know, somebody says, well, when were you saved? Well, I was saved before the foundation of the world. <laughs> when the Lord Jesus Christ as the lamb of slain before the foundation of the world entered into a covenant promise with his father, I was saved. I was saved on Calvary's cross when he bowed his mighty head and declared that it's finished. 
He paid the full price, but he called me when it pleased God who separated my mother's womb and called me by his grace. This is the, and the calling comes only through hearing. Second Timothy chapter one, verse nine. He hath saved us and called us. Now, which one comes before the other? <laughs> Saving comes before calling. He hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. According, uh, I'm sorry, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace in Christ Jesus. Our Lord said in John 5, 23, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall never condemn condemnation because he hath passed from death unto life. He that heareth and believeth. This man heard that the Lord Jesus Christ was coming or was in Cana and he left. In the next verse in that John 5 verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of God and shall, and shall come. <laughs> they that hear shall live. We are spiritually dead. The Lord has to give us ears to hear. Here we have a man who is desperate for life. This is the nature of faith. And he heard that Christ was coming. And uh, the evidence that he heard something was that he left home and went to Cana to find the Lord Jesus. <laughs> he didn't send a servant. This was a nobleman. He could have sent a servant. He could have said, you know, I heard that there's a man in Cana. You know, go, go get him. Bring him here. I'm not going to leave the side of my child. No, he went himself. The evidence that we hear is that we come. We come to where he is. This is the works. Meet for repentance. When the scripture says, that to do works meet for repentance. We used to think, well, you know, we've got to prove that we're saved by, you know, by showing everybody how good we are. Now works meet for repentance is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and coming to him in faith. It's coming to him. Many hear, but they refuse to come. The Lord Jesus said, you will not come unto me that you might have life. He's speaking to those Pharisees. And why did he say? He said, because you love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You won't come to me. You want your honor to, be come, to come from men. Come unto me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy burdened. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. Learn of me. Learn of me. His burden is light because he bore the burden of our sin on Calvary's cross. We come to Christ. The nature of saving faith is number one, Lord, I'm going to die without it. This is life and death. This is not just to improve my life or fix a problem or, you know, make, make things a little better. No, this is, this is eternal life and eternal death. Saving faith begins with hearing, and that hearing causes us to come. If any man thirst, if any man thirst, let him come and drink from the river of life freely, freely. What is it to come? In religion, the man makes a lot of outward um, uh, shows of coming. You know, you either walk an aisle or you pray a prayer or you, you, you perform a work or you participate in a ceremony or these are the things. No, coming is something that happens in the heart. 
would come to Christ right now, right where you are. And tonight, when you're lying in your bed, you come to Christ again. (laughs) And in the morning when you wake up and the Lord's mercies are renewed every day, you come to Christ again. And when the Spirit of God convicts you of your sin, you come to Christ again. To whom coming? This matter of coming to Christ is not an outward show. It's a work of grace in the heart. This is what saving faith is. Lord, I'm going to die if you don't give me, if you don't save me. Lord, I heard that you were here and I've come. (laughs) I've come and 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 I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you. We lay down the weapons of our rebellion and we cry for mercy. And we just keep coming. Keep coming. True faith, saving faith, saving faith, pleads for mercy. As I said, this word, this word, sir, translated in verse 49 is actually the word curios. And it's, it's most always translated Lord. Here was a nobleman bowing to a a carpenter, (laughs) Uh, 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 you know, a a man with no worldly means and no real outward recognition. And he comes to him and he sees him and he bows to him and he pleads with him. That's, That's what saving faith does. Lord, he, I, he didn't say, come and I'll, I'll, I'll compensate you for your troubles. Or, don't you know who I am? Come. Come and follow me. No. No, he came and he, and he pleaded with him. Scripture says that he um, uh, has the, the, word, the word that's used here. The nobleman uh, asked him. He... he uh, There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick. And when he heard that Jesus, verse 47, had come down from Judea to Galilee, he went unto him and he besought him. He pleaded with him. (laughs) And that's how we come. We don't come with, well, you know, I accepted Jesus and so therefore you're obligated to save me. Or, you know, I prayed this prayer and I was very sincere about it and therefore you're obligated to save me. No, we, we can't do anything to obligate God any more than this nobleman could do. We're mercy beggars. We can't say, well, I confessed my sins and therefore you're obligated to forgive me. No. No, Lord, have mercy upon me. According to thy loving kindness, according to thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Lord, not according to anything that I've done or anything that I've brought. Saving faith has no claim on God. It's completely dependent upon his mercy and his grace to save. A leper came to the Lord, said, Lord, I know you can heal me if you will. I know you can, if you will. It's all completely up to you. My salvation is completely in your hands. Nothing, (laughs) nothing in my hand I bring, only to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, I cling. I'm just clinging to you, Lord. David said in Psalm 25, have mercy on me for I am desolate and afflicted. I'm desolate and afflicted. This is what saving faith is. Saving faith just pleads for God's mercy. Um, The centurion who came to the Lord and and said, Lord, I'm not worthy. (laughs) I'm not worthy that you should come into my house. Only speak the word and my servant should be healed. Well, I've got, I've got no claim on God. We don't, do we? But what, what delight he has in showing mercy. 
Mercy is for sinners who have no claim on God. That's who he delights in. Blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Oh, be of good cheer, Bartimaeus, the master calleth thee. He's calling thee. You see, the call of God, the call of God works both ways. He calls us. He puts it in our hearts to call on him. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. No one's ever called upon him that's been refused by him. Not with empty hands. No, you come to him. He said, all that the Father hath given unto me will come unto me. And he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. No wise. No one coming as a mercy beggar has been cast away. Not a single one. That's how this man came. He besought him. And then he called him Lord. And he pleaded with him. And he, did, he never offered his credentials. He never demanded anything. Lord, come. If you don't come, death is coming. So he had a desperate need for life. He heard about the Lord Jesus Christ, which caused him to come to where the Lord Jesus Christ was. He begs for mercy. True faith, true faith will always be tried in order to prove that it's true faith. Always. Here we have it, look. After this man asked the Lord to come, Jesus said unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Wasn't looking for a sign or wonder. The Lord knew that. Well, the Lord tried his faith. And he tries your faith and tries my faith. And genuine faith, uh, it, it continues even in the midst of that, of that trial. I love it when, when uh, Naomi, uh, she did everything that she could do to get Ruth to stay behind with her sister-in-law. You know, she gave her every reason to stay behind. Ruth, no, you're not, you don't want to go with me. Man, I'm an old lady. If I, if, if I got married again and was able to have a child, you know, you're, gonna, you're not going to have a, a husband by me. Stay here within Moab. What did Ruth say? And, 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 the, and the other daughter left. And, and Ruth said, oh, no. No, don't push me away. Your God is my God. Your people is my people. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. <laughs> That's what the Lord did to You see, it's, it's proving of faith. If faith that is of God is not going to be deterred, even if the circumstances are contrary to the promises of God. Uh, that's the reason that the Lord said to the disciples, will you leave me also? 5,000 people had just proven that they didn't have faith. <laughs> they only wanted their bellies full. They didn't have saving faith. The Lord told them, you know, to die to themselves and take up their cross and and follow him, they turned around and went home. And looked at his disciples said, aren't you going to follow them? Aren't you going to go with them? <laughs> and Peter said, Lord, where should we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Lord, you, you've shut us up to yourself. You, you can try to deter us and, 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 and make circumstances such that we have reason to doubt. But we've got no place to go. True saving faith is always tried. It's always proven by the fires of trials and troubles. You know what the Lord was doing with that Syrophoenician woman who came to the Lord and begged him? 
She had a desperate need just like this nobleman did for her daughter. And the Lord began by ignoring her and then the disciples embarrassed her publicly and then the Lord Jesus Christ called her a dog. She had every reason to be deterred from her faith. The Lord proves your faith and my faith the same way. He will, he will send circumstances that seem contrary to his grace and mercy and his love and trials and troubles in our lives. And, and many, many will be like those 5,000. They'll walk away. No, this isn't. This is too hard. This is too hard. But those who have saving faith, they're going to remain. They're going to remain. When the Lord tarried those extra two days, what was he doing? He was proving Martha and Mary's faith. Came to Lazarus and came to the tomb. And, oh, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. No, Mary, I, I waited because you needed this. You need this for your faith. When the Lord, the Lord ordered the steps of all men. And when he was, when Jairus, another man who was pleading with the Lord to come and, and, and save his child. And, uh, and the Lord gave that interruption of the woman with the issue of blood and and then finally, Jairus' servant came in and said, Bother the master no more. Thy son is dead. Her daughter, the little daughter, their daughter's dead. And our Lord said, Don't be afraid. <laughs> See, that was a divine interruption in our Lord's path to Jairus' house in order to give time for that child to die. Jairus needed that. Isn't that amazing. True saving faith is always going to be proven. It's always going to be proven. And if it's not real, those trials will cause you to give up. You quit. True faith persists in spite of all opposing circumstances. True faith keeps, keeps coming. <laughs> God bring you to the place where you've got nothing but faith. That's a good place to be. Isn't it? A good place to be. True saving faith just simply takes God at his word. Saving faith is not, is not, well, if I just believe something hard enough, I can make God do it. No, it's taking him at his word. This nobleman believed the word that the Lord had spoken unto him. Go thy way. Go thy way. Look, there it is in verse 50. Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. True saving faith can't not believe. It just believes God. You know, if you really believe God's word, you're a believer. You're a believer. You're not... And well, yeah, I, you know, yeah, but it's not a yeah, but it's yes, Lord, truth, Lord. And we have so many precious promises to hang the hopes of our immortal souls on, don't we? So many. Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Lord, you've all I know to do is cry and call. Faith clings to God's word. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me. 
Though he die, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Believest thou this? Believest thou this? And, and, you, and you say just what you're saying right now, Adam. Amen. I do. I do believe that. Taking God at his word. He has given me faith to believe his word. I will never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> the Lord delights in showing mercy. This is a faithful saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Lord, you've made me to be a sinner, and I, I just believe, I believe God's word. I believe you. I can't not believe you. It's taking God. This nobleman believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. Go thy way, thy son liveth. He had nothing else. And no other evidence other than the word that had been spoken Unto him. Seventh. True faith. Grows. In the depths. Of its. Conviction. And confidence. And assurance. He believed the word. That the Lord had spoken unto him. But then when he got home. And he asked his servant. So what hour did his fever leave him? Well, the seventh hour yesterday, and he knew that that's exactly when the Lord had spoken. One o'clock in the afternoon, the Lord had spoken unto him. And himself believed all the more and his household. True saving faith grows. It grows. You believe God more now than you did last year. You just do. He's proven it. He's proven himself to be faithful over and over again. He's, he's revealed more truths to your heart. And you, you just believe him now more. <laughs> You know, saving faith is like a mustard seed. It starts out very small and it grows. And it provides a habitation for the birds of the air when it grows into a tree and it produces fruit. And, and then the husbandman comes along and he prunes it and that's painful. But through the pruning, it produces more fruit. True saving faith grows. This man believed the word that had been spoken unto him. But then when he heard... <laughs> Exactly when his child had been healed. Oh, he believed all the more. We become more convinced the more of his grace we see. So that Paul at the end of his life said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the judge, shall give to me, and not just to me only, but all them that love his appearing. We love his appearing now more than we did before. And uh, in the nature of saving faith, I want you to notice that saving faith encourages other lost sheep to have faith. Your faith encourages my faith. You know, you call a, a brother or sister who's in a great trial, maybe even nigh unto death, and you think you're going to be a word of encouragement to them, and you, and you get off the phone and your heart has been so encouraged by their faith. Go visit a brother in the hospital or sister, or you speak to a, someone. You, your faith. This man went home, <laughs> and he heard exactly when his faith, when his son had been healed, and not only did he believe more, but his whole house. 
Now, I know in religion, men say, well, you know, I want other people to see Jesus in me and I want to influence others to come to Christ. And they didn't see Jesus in Jesus. And you're not going to influence a reprobate to come to Christ. But that doesn't change the fact that our faith does encourage others who are of God's elect people to come and to believe all the more. We do. We, we encourage one another in the faith. And we can discourage one another, can't we? We can discourage one another. He believed and his whole house. Did the Lord not say, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria? Not to be a stumbling block? You know, we're... we're oh, child of God... Your faith, you, don't, don't underestimate the influence that you have and the responsibility that you have on other believers. <laughs> he believed and his whole house. And I would say this to husbands and fathers. Don't underestimate the influence and the responsibility that you have over your home. He believed in his whole house. You know, it's a, and I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm fishing with a net. I'm not targeting anybody here, but you see the application of this, don't you? Uh, it's a shameful thing when a man relinquishes the, the, the greatest responsibility that he has in his home. He thinks, well, I'm here to provide and protect my family. No, you're there to lead them. And spiritual leadership is the most important leadership that a man can have in his home. And it's the greatest need that his wife and children have. <laughs> So the Lord says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Who takes responsibility of the leadership between, the, between Christ and his church? The Lord does. That's what he's saying. This man went home and he heard and he believed and he believed more. And he told his wife and his children and and his servants and his whole household believed. He had, a, he had an influence on them. This is what saving faith does. Say, well, I feel like I failed as, a, as an example in so many ways. May the Lord increase our faith. All of us can see failures in being examples to others. But uh, Lord, increase our faith. Our Heavenly Father, might we learn from this nobleman the nature of true saving faith. And Lord, might you give us a trust and childlike dependence and humility and grace to hear and to come and to believe and to take you at your word. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Number 12, let's stand together. <clears throat> Upon my great and sovereign God, I cast my soul and rest. My Father's hand controls the world, and what he does is best.
So be still, my heart, and doubt no more. Believe and find sweet rest. God's wisdom, love, and truth, and power combine to make thee blessed. In raging storms and fiery trials, He keeps me from all harms. He walks with me and holds me in His everlasting arms. So be still, my heart, and doubt no more. Believe and find sweet rest. God's wisdom, love, and truth, and power combine to make thee blessed. My God, with skill infallible and great designs of grace, with power and love that never fail, shall order all my ways. So be still, my heart, and doubt no more. Believe and find sweet rest. God's wisdom, love, and Truth and power combine to make thee blessed. My life's most minute circumstance is ordered by my God, who promised that in all things he will ever do me good. So be still, my heart, and doubt no more. Believe and find sweet rest. God's wisdom, love, and truth, and power combine to make thee blessed.